Okay, so hello. So hello, everyone. My name is Kylie Miller, and I'm a student at Washington and Jefferson College. And now I serve as the social media assistant editor for the Culture and Psychology Journal. And I'm here with Dr. Olga Lehmann uh, from the Institute of Psychological Counseling in Bergen, Norway. And she also leads the Health and Compassionate uh, practices at Percademy. She was previously working as a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Mental Health, NTNU, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And she published extensively about feelings and emotions, silence phenomenon, exist existential meaning, poetic instances, and qualitative methods. Today we're talking about her paper with Dr. Brinkman on revisiting the art of being fragile why cultural psychology needs literature and poetry. So Dr. Lehman, I just wanna say thank you for being here. We're so uh, welcoming to you. My pleasure. I'm very excited and honored that you chose me to launch these videos of the journal, and especially about this paper that touches my heart very deeply because it, uh, yeah, it condenses most of my interest, personal and academic. So I look forward to our chat today. Great. I just wanted to ask you first more about like your paper. So in it, you talk about poetry and literature. So can you expand on uh, the possibilities for scientific innovation? Yes, I think there's at least two nuances. Uh, that's how you say it in English, right? <laughs> two, <laughs> two nuances of, of scientific innovation. And I think one is that I strongly believe that literature and poetry can foster theoretical insights because I mean, Poets and writers, they devote their lives to words to find this very accuracy to describe human experience and human existence. So we have like a lot of richness of, of data and understanding and empathy and insight into how the human mind works and these tensions between our thoughts, our feelings, our actions. And, uh, and um, so that's the, the, I think that having such richness in, in data available, give us this possibility to better understand, especially from my perspective, which is where I feel cultural psychology still has a lot of work to do to understand effective processes even deeper. Because uh, we are very good at framing, I don't know, studies of higher psychological functions like memory, imagination. I think we're gonna talk further about this a little bit later. I personally, I hope no one hates me here or my colleagues think we can do a better job in understanding affect, feeling, emotions. And that's where I think the theoretical insights of the richness of poetry and literature. I also think that scientific innovation can be uh, in terms of methodology. And I think there's a lot we can do in terms of qualitative research. Uh, for example, not, not the least, as I just mentioned before, using literature as data because of the richness of these descriptions. But also I have used, for example, not in this paper, but in another paper, uh, a technique of analysis called poetic representations. I have not developed that myself, but it's, uh, but it's, very, it's more used in anthropology and sociology. Um, feels humanities and I think it's just this kind of being more creative in the ways in which we yeah unify or or categorize information or describe these intersections between the data because I think in qualitative methods sometimes we can be a bit reductionist right this is the category this is where we found but the human mind is more intertwined and um, and trying to be more poetic as we write it can also make our papers more readable, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm also really interested in like how the methods worked with like going through the literature um, and having those like generalizations of like the literature work when you're relying on like the interpretations of others, like how do you kind of filter through those and like get other people's opinions on what, what they're reading? Yeah. Uh, just to double check, I, under, I understood your question. It's like taking as an example that we are using a, a novel as a data. Like, mm -hmm. how do I check that I'm understanding what the author meant or things like that? Right. Well, um, I think is what I, I think what I did in this case of the per, paper very broadly was to read this book from cover to cover a couple of times and try to highlight like to try to to make like summaries, right? Like 
from the each chapter or each letter, because this book is composed from different letters, what are the paragraphs that are the key points? So that kind of gave me a more like objective sense of the summaries. And then from this, this then I guess qualitative research on my perspective is a bit more intuitive. So then you try to say, okay, which of these uh, paragraphs speaks more about these kind of themes or the theoretical ideas as Ben and I had. And of course, what helped me the most was this the, the Italian writer, Alessandro Davenia. He was so kind enough to answer my emails and my Instagram <laughs> private messages. So, so that that helped me. That helped me really like double checking that the intuitions I had were also some of the intuitions he had when he was writing the novel. So I'm a very curious person and I'm for the goods and the bads, I'm not very afraid of reaching out to people. So if it was like an ethical commitment for me, if I'm writing about the novel of a famous writer, no matter if he doesn't reply, I will inform him, right? Of course, I also wanted to go through some copyright issues, which we kind of, um, I think that's one of the main limitations of, of using literature yeah in research even so but he was very nice he was very open that i could do the translations to english myself and i i would encourage any young researcher or senior researcher that wants to use pieces of art or literature or poetry as data just to reach out to the authors or to the publishers because there are some logistic issues that are very important for to avoid ethical dilemmas but also I think, and we're gonna back, go back to speak a little bit about ethics, I think later on. I think for, my, for me, it's like a responsibility, act of responsibility. When I use interviews, for example, I reach out to my participants in the preliminary phases of analysis and I give them drafts of my paper and say, we need to do this double checking, no matter if it's the author of a book or just the person we recorded an interview from. I think that's just a part of being, uh, committed researcher on my perspective right right kind of similar to that I had a question on like your relationship with the author like emailing them back and forth um it seems like it would be very unique just like being on Instagram and uh emailing <laughs> but like how how did that go and can you just like talk a little bit about like the engagement between the text and the author yeah absolutely so um I used to live in Italy myself. That's where I did my master's degree in clinical and health psychology. So, so I tried to, to read Italian books just to keep the language alive. So that was the kind of the first connection because I don't, I'm not sure this book is translated into English yet. I think it's available in 10 other languages. So, um, so that was the first connection. I think the language helps. Of course, he speaks English as well, but uh, I think the fact that I try my best to write in Italian and to say that I was reading and that I was living in the same city where he lives, that kind of build a shared meaning. I don't expect all famous writers to be as humble as him. <laughs> I, think, I think not many people have the time, availability or the openness to share. But he felt very honored that there were some researchers in Denmark and Norway that actually were writing something about him. So it was it, because he works as a teacher in a school. Because so he also knows a lot about psychology and is very curious. Um, so I think the first time I reached out to him was very spontaneous, be even before writing the paper. It was more like I was just writing about a gratitude that I was reading something that really help me personally. And then I think when I decided to write it, then when he answered, he answered very long and, and it was really nice, the things he said. So that's where I said, is it okay if I decide to, to write a paper about it? And he was very open about it. Uh, like very, yeah, as I said, very honored. Uh, so I think that was it. I also sent him a draft of the paper before it was published, just, the, just for him to approve it anyways. And as I said before, I would do that with my research participants anyways. And then uh, we exchanged a couple of book suggestions. So it was just very, something very organic in a way. Uh, so I feel very lucky because I don't think, I don't expect that to be the case with all the writers. Yeah, that's why I was actually gonna ask, like, were there any limitations or challenges that you faced like during this process? 
I think I was very afraid about the copyright issues because I have been working with poetry and research and, uh, you know, copyright is very, and sometimes it's, yeah, it's like a very, how can I say in English, like the threshold is very gray, a lot of gray zones and it can be very hectic with the publishers. So I think lucky and luckily the book was not available in English because then you dodge the copyright if you are making your translations. It was not very easy to translate to, into English because uh, Italian language is very rich and nuanced. It's very poetic, but I tried my best. And then I also had a friend who's an English speaker to help me with the English. And I had an Italian friend to also help me to double check the translations made sense. And I also sent them, of course, to the author to make sure that this was <laughs> what he meant. So I think this was kind of the challenge, but I also think it was so important the collaborate the collaborative process, especially when you are working with literature and you are translating things. I think we need to double check with people like can proofread and it's not just about the wordings, it's sometimes also about conveying the emotion. Right. So that was like challenging, but also very exciting. <laughs> and self-critique, if I had to add something. Uh, as much as I like writing, I think I have a very huge self-critic. So at the beginning, I was, it was, uh, I shared the idea and a draft with another colleague and with Sven, and I was hoping that, not hoping, but I was expecting that Sven would say, okay, Olga, this is not publishable, and <laughs> it was not, but he was so engaged and gave me, um, working with Sven is very good because he's very sharp in his feedback and in, in his orientations and these theoretical insights. So uh, I think it's, it's good not to write alone at times. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, I just wanted to go more in depth of the article itself. Mm -hmm. You pull quotes. Uh, I just wanted to pull one quote here. It says, imagination is not just something for poets, but of human beings who make poetry from each of their actions. So it seems like these fit very well with your discussion later on and when you talk about poetic motion, but can you just tell us more about uh, this, both like how do we observe poetry in human actions, but also how does imagination fit into all of this? Absolutely. So uh, I think that uh, that quote you read uh, was from Alessandro, not mine, right? That, uh, that when he was referring about this, I just think like I want to say very shortly what the book is about, just to give some context to the people who are, uh, uh, going to watch this video and shortly said this book consists um, of some letters that Alessandro D'Avenia, this Italian teacher and writer, is writing in his imagine using his own imagination to this very famous Italian poet Giacomo Leopardi and it's like a biographical epistolar like that in between like letters and a novel, but it's, it's an act of imagination in itself, these letters. And that is very important for me to highlight this because I think what he refers to, he's th thanking also uh, Giacomo Leopardi for how he portrays imagination and poetry together. Why is this very important for us as human beings in our everyday lives? Because being human is very hard, sometimes unbearable, you know, we cannot avoid, as much as I like talking about poetry and feelings, I'm an existential psychologist, right? So I cannot undermine the tragic nature of life. Without imagination, a life will be quite unbearable. So our imagination does not resolve the tensions or our existential givings, but it helps us to give some spark and to give us also some hope and I do believe that this novel, The Art of Being Fragile, is a novel about hope. It's a novel that wants to, to, to encourage people, especially young people, not to lose ho hope as they, we are embracing the, the hardships of being human. So, and that's what I connect with this notion of Emily Abbey of poetic motion, because this is a poet, uh, this is a, she's also a poet. <laughs> this is a notion that she uses to, um, to describe this tension that we have between what is and what could be and how we are using imagination all the time to kind of uh, move along in our everyday life living. In addition to this hope that I think we can portray, 
by, by, by means of imagination, what I feel is the strongest resource of poetry is the connection of beauty. For example, when I am analyzing this quote, I mentioned a little bit grief as an example. I now for another project, I am using, um, doing some research on grief and I, we do therapeutic writing. So I support parents who have lost their children to write their way through grief. And I tell them when we are going so deep into the darkness of grief, we need a lighthouse. So these kind of metaphors or pictures of poetry or beauty, they are, they are just making it possible for us to, to walk through the darkness, but they don't erase the darkness of, of life. And that I think is what requires sometimes imagination because if life is so, so, so tragic, perhaps we need some fantasy to make this lighthouse possible. And it's also a, a way of training attention. I think we're gonna speak about that later on. I think first we can use fantasy as a way to be more aware of beauty, but I do, maybe I'm an idealist, but I think this poetic mo motion or these poetic ways of living for us is about just tuning our attention to these small nuances or this instance where, uh, where the beauty of life is more available to us. I really like the um, the way you use the lighthouse. I think that's a really good oh, thing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, the next thing I just wanted to talk about is you also make the argument towards the end of the manuscript that poetic instants are a source of further attention as a higher psychological function. So how can we as cultural psychologists examine this function microgenetically? Wow, that's a question. Huh? Now I feel like I am in the dissertation of my PhD again. <laughs> no. Okay, yes. So I, if I understand you correctly, your question has two layers. One of them refers, recalls to the ways in which poetic instants connect with the attention as a higher psychological function. And the second of them is how could we potentially study this microgenetically, right? So as I introduced before, I think this sparks of beauty, like poetic instant, and just like this, you know, we, every hour every hour has 60 minutes, every day has 24 hours, but not each hour, not each second, not each, not each minute means the same for us. We are living in kind of this, not just chronological time, but this more phenomenological time or poetic time or, or, or whatever you want to call it. And I think these poetic instants are this kind of peaks that enable us to go to some, yeah, to some in different intensities or emotional tonalities. And I think there is a strong connection between these emotional tonalities and attention because we remember more or sometimes we put in our unconscious, if you believe in the unconscious, those, mom, those instants that are a bit more traumatic because the peaks can be to the heaven or to hell, right? Um, and I do also believe, and I see it in my work as a psychotherapist, that we can train this capacity for attention, not just for attention, but also for appreciation. Um, but for me, the study of attention is inter or the study of any higher psychological function is strongly interconnected to, with affect. And that's where I, as I said before, that's where I see we cultural psychologists could do a way better work to more better connecting understanding of feelings and emotions to this. Mm -hmm. So that's how I also see we can study this microgenetically. I myself have been studying uh, journaling as a technique of analysis for very long and I keep using it in my current research projects. So I would assume that either we can uh, use the literature, again, poetry, novels, to look about how people describe this kind of instance or characters in novels, or how the dialogues between these memories about poetic instance take place. I myself, when I'm collecting that, where I was collecting data for my PhD and my postdoctoral fellow and my current research project, I ask people to write a lot. I already have a, an inner Jan Balsiner in my mind that will have a critique <laughs> about this and is that this will be a reconstructive microgenetic analysis and that has a lot of limitations. And I guess Jan, of course, following Vygotsky would like to do a more like a, how do you say in English when this is not retrospective, prospective, like it goes move along in the future. 
So maybe an idea would be, for example, I know the the, the work that Brady uh, Wagoner and Nikki Karlamova are doing with uh, these glasses where you are capturing things in the life. And I think maybe other cultural psychologists have used this, but they use it to study memory. So I would put the nuances to get more information about the impact, the emotional impact of this. And, uh, and, and I think the advantage of using videos for microgenetic analysis is that you maybe can see the shifts in attentional focus because our gaze gives a lot of information about attentional shifts, of course. So those are the main ideas, that three that pop up to my mind. Descriptions available in literature or videos or journaling. Thank you. Maybe um, movies also. You. I wonder your, <laughs> your time as well. So do you have time for like one or two more questions? Of course. <laughs> um, the next question I had was, your article seems to tie both silence and poetry as interdependent on each other. And that the study one, you have to acknowledge the presence of the other. So can, you, can we separate silence and poetry? And if not, what does that say about the two? Yeah, uh, well, in my doctoral thesis, I think poetry and silence were super intertwined. And I do believe they are very, some realms of silence are way more intertwined to poetry or poetic instance than others. I follow some theoretical perspectives of Octavio Paz and Gaston Bachelard, where they describe poetry as silent because the mission of poetry is to configure some words so that they evoke an image or evoke an emotional intensity. So if you see the mission of poetry is to use words to bring you to the boundaries of language. So that then, and sometimes I don't know when you read poems that sometimes you don't even know because poets sometimes use very fancy words. And you're like, I don't even know what that words means, but you get a feeling, you get an intuition. Or then you try to explain to people what you felt when you were listening to a beautiful song. And you're like, no, it's like some songwriters are so good, right? They are poets. They give account of these kind of things that we struggle to speak in everyday lives. And that's like a connection to language as well. Language is one of our main tools, but when it comes to feelings and emotions, all of us struggle quite a lot to describe what we feel <laughs> in our everyday lives. And that causes a lot of challenges or struggle or struggles. So I think that's when they are intertwined. I mean, I know we don't have so much time to go through about it, but silence or silence phenomena is way more extensive. Like the word silence means many other things, but that I'll leave for another video, at least just for making this connection that has more to do with the food. Great, thank you. Um, and then your concluding note mentions that doing more compassionate and empathetic research is an act of ethical disclosure. Could you just explain this more and what you meant by this? Yes, I think for me, it means at least a couple of things. First of all, uh, I follow uh, Mark Freeman. He was the opponent of my doctoral thesis and is one of the psychologists and theorists I admire the most. And he speaks more about the need of psychology to be more faithful to what is it to be human. And I do believe that when we reach out to poets or to writers that are so accurate in describing human experience and human existence, then we, we maybe have richer data, you know? Because if you, for example, now we are having an interview, you and I, and I'm trying my best to describe things, but I know that we are having some little gaps, right? Because of my Spanglish or whatever it is. But if we go to a writer that has used 15 years to really make this masterpiece, that, that maybe is way more faithful than a three hour interview, even though that interview can be very good as well, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to create stereotypes about quality of data in a way, but I just want to emphasize that the richer the data is, then the richer our insights or the more faithful art. And I think there's an ethical commitment we have as qualitative researchers, right? Or it's a way to achieve validity in a way that we are speaking about what, that we are studying as accurately as possible, whatever is it that we are studying. So that's one thing. The other thing is that when it comes to compassion, like uh, shortly said, compassion is empathy into action, right? So the more we can tune into what are the human, the more we can, or the better we understand the complexity of, of human needs and human wants, 
the more we can create tools to for behavioral changes or community inter inter interventions to make cultural psychology more more available, not just theoretically, which is something we are already very good at, but but practically in terms of the impact we have in, in society. And that's what I think is also an ethical commitment. The more compassion we are, the more we are doing to, to alleviate suffering in a way. So to put the researcher more into the field. Does this make, an, if this makes any sense? Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, and I just am curious like what your next steps are based on like this paper <laughs> and like next steps for cultural psychology in general. Oh, well, absolutely. Well, now um, I keep writing. I think eventually I'll publish my book about silence for public dissemination if, um, if I just need to make more time available for writing. And I, I made like a transition now. Now I'm working in a private institute and clinic or research institute. So I'm mostly devoted to psychotherapy. And I use these notions of poetic instance. I use literature and arts a lot uh, with my clients. So that's given me a possibility just to confirm as well some insights I had theoretically to see how, wow, this is really powerful in the therapy room. So in addition to this, um, how devoted I am to psychotherapy in my new job, I'm, I'm leading a, a research project on grief. So I. I am developing an, an eight week course on therapeutic writing for parents who have lost their children. So that's not exactly therapy, it's more like a writing course or using yeah, tools of therapeutic writing. And that's, um, and, and then I am applying not just, sometimes we read poems together and we use insights from poets, but I am also encouraging people to write poems or to write, uh, for example, if you were writing an autobiography about your and, and the chapter about your grief, how would the first uh, page of the novel could look like? And just making this kind of act of of delving into how is it to find the right words and being more curious about the uses of words to describe our feelings and emotions. That's kind of the steps uh, further for for me in particular. And I'm also editing a book about the poetics of aging or editing with my colleague Odgir Sines in Oslo, which is because I'm my postdoctoral fellow, I work a lot with, uh, I hire a poet and a novelist to teach writing courses for older adults here in Norway. And, um, and I got a lot of insights about how powerful writing it is as a community intervention in that way. So I could keep my passion about defending or advocating for poetry and literature as a way of data collection or as a way of data in everyday life. And also more theorizing about the impact that this has in our everyday lives as tools. So that uh, in a more slow pace now that I'm doing more psychotherapy, which is also very exciting for me because it's my something I'm very passionate about as well. Great, well, it was so great hearing all these things from you and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us too. Oh, it's my very pleasure. I look forward to watch the video already. <laughs>